Abai Frabent, Abaim Krabis Tabba Fabba Saba Saban, Fabif Tabi Yabias Abagabo, Abai Krabi Abe Tebed Zaboon. Abend what? What? Oh, um, I've just been told that for this event, we can't use Abi Dabi, the language we invented and used on the program. We have to speak in English. So I'll translate. I'll start from the beginning. Hi friends, I'm Christopher Sarsen, and 50 years ago, I created Zoom and was the executive producer of the show for three years. Zoom was one of the best loved children's shows on public television, and a unique feature of the show was that we asked viewers to send in material which we performed on the program. In the three years I was exec producer, we got nearly a million and a half letters addressed to Zoom Box 350, Boston, Mass 0234. No wonder we won three Emmy Awards. Did the program have a lasting effect? Well, just look at you, the audience. Last week, on the first of these seminars, 50 years after the event, and nearly a thousand of you signed up to talk to one group of Zoomers. And right now, we've got you group, we've got you guys signed up to speak to another member of these first, uh, to other members of these first casts. Thank you for coming. You're watching this event on a Zoom webinar platform. That's Zoom, the internet um, uh, platform, not Zoom, the TV show. Let me tell you what that means. You can see and hear us. And although we can't hear and see you, we can certainly get messages that you send us. To send us a question or comment, click the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type your message, and then click enter to send it to our moderator. We'll feed it to the panelists. Because we have so many viewers, we probably won't be able to answer all your questions, but we'll answer as many as we can, and we'll certainly read everything you send us. Thank you in advance for sending us your message. Before we start the actual webinar, I want to show you a TV clip. See if you recognize it, and if you do, please sing along. By the way, we cheated a bit. <laughs> uh, the clip included Louise and David, and they couldn't make it uh, uh, to the webinar tonight. And Laurie and Donna were in a different cast, so they went in the choreography, but we did show their signatures. I'm Laurie and I'm Donna. On to the show. Let me introduce our moderator, David Camp. He's a journalist and author of many books, one of which is called Sunny Days, the children's television revolution that changed America. The book has a whole chapter devoted to Zoom, and it's well worth reading. David, thank you for being our moderator. Please introduce our panelists. Christopher, first of all, it's an honor to be here. And um, 
I stand or rather sit in awe of all of you Zoomers because I was one of those Generation X kids who watched you at home and thought of you as titans, albeit relatable titans. So it's so amazing to get to talk to you again. We're gonna start by going around. I'm gonna quote from the song, who are you, what do you do? So we can catch up with our Zoomers as adults. Um, so Maura, who are you, what do you do? Wow, I get to go first again, huh? <laughs> My name is Mara Mullaney. Um, it is uh, an incredible pleasure to be here tonight with all of you who are watching and all of you who are here participating as cast members. Um, so who am I and what do I do? Well, I uh, after Zoom, I did uh, some stage shows for a while and I did a little bit of voiceover work for a couple of years. Uh, got to work on the Zoom album, which was one of the most fun experiences that uh, I can recall having. Um, yes, I got to college, I was dabbling a little bit in music and radio. I studied political science and my original thought was uh, journalism or law school. Uh, however, <laughs> I ended up uh, quite unexpectedly becoming a railroad conductor. Uh, and uh, that's been uh, a pretty amazing and fun experience. Um, I've gotten to travel quite a bit, so, so that's great. Um, outside of work, um, still try to remain athletic whenever possible. Um, my days of playing hockey are over, but I do uh, try to at least golf or, or work out whenever I can. Um, I also like to coach youth sports, uh, which I have done. And uh, I'm quite active politically and uh, I'm very passionate about uh, many social justice issues. And also like to volunteer uh, and do a lot of work with animal rescue. So uh, try to stay busy. Well, when I asked, what do you do? I, I really got a thorough answer. <laughs> And now we'll move on to Anne. Who are you? What do you do? Anne, I believe you're muted. Here you are. Work finally? Good. Um, let's see. Who am I? Well, mostly I'm the mother of three amazing kids who are grown up now and a fantastic husband. I'm not his mom, but I am his wife. Um, I've been a family <laughs> practice doctor for many, many years. And uh, several years ago, I started a nonprofit organization called One Good Turn. And the purpose is to travel to remote areas all over the world where I provide medical education to people who are already taking, doing the healthcare in their community, but just don't have access to the internet or medical books. So I teach folks who are already taking care of everybody in their community, the best practices for basic medical problems. It's been incredibly rewarding. And I think a little bit like more, I've had an opportunity to see a lot of the world that has just widened my perspective on so many different things. Extraordinary. And now, Lori, who are you? What do you do? Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Christopher, thank you so much for this opportunity. I wouldn't be here without you. Um, after Zoom, I um, went to college in Boston, and then I transferred to a college in California. Um, I stayed there for a while and was dabbling in the camping industry. Um, and I ran dance camps and bodybuilding camps and weight loss camps. And then I got my graduate degree at UCLA. And since the early 90s, um, I'm not aging myself because y'all know we're over 50. Um, I have been working uh, in higher ed. Um, I have been an alumni director for many universities across uh, the state of California. Um, I'm married to a wonderful man. And I have a delicious, awesome, we have a delicious, awesome daughter. Um, I love being a mom and um, I loved I loved being on Zoom and I love seeing my Zoom family. Wonderful. And before I go on to our next Zoomer, I want to reiterate, please uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box. We're really going to make an effort to answer as many as we can, as long as they're decorous and not terribly invasive questions. Uh, but we really want to hear from you because that's part of the ethos of Zoom. And now, Leon, who are you? What do you do? Hi. I'm Leon. I am a musician, as you can tell. I have a, a signature series drum, the djembe made by Remo. I play with Ben Harper in The Innocent Criminals. Uh, I've worked with everyone from Michael Jackson to Mick Jagger. I also still act. I was on 
NCIS last week, episode 12 of season one. <laughs> I see a clip of that. I perform, I, I, I record, I, I'm producing an album, <laughs> Bernadette. Uh, I sing and I dance, you know. Can I say something? He is exactly the same as he was when he was 11 years old. That's... <laughs> well, we admire that, don't we? And I think our audience would too. And now let's continue. Donna, who are you? What do you do? Oh, hey. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, David and Chris and the Toms behind the scenes. And hey, viewers. Uh, so I'm Donna uh, Moore and uh, pretty much um, I am now a writer of musical theater. I've uh, written uh, the book, lyrics and music to an off-Broadway uh, musical that ran for a couple years and spawned around the world. I'm very proud of it. And it looks like it might be licensed again in the near future, so I'm really excited. Uh, for the last six years or so, I've been a writer for hire and have had to like just flex all different muscles that I didn't know I had. Um, I uh, wrote a short film, a web series, two documentaries, and I'm now working on a, like an Entertainment Tonight TV show. Um, I also create my own content. And um, four years ago, right around the time when the Me Too movement was starting, I wrote a, a television premise uh, based, uh, well, based on the Me Too movement and somehow art imitated life. And I'm now a co-founder of a tech startup um, with the mission to make the world safer. And we create uh, phone apps that assess, treat, and prevent sexual misconduct for children and adults. So, uh, and then and, uh, I also do dabble in stand-up comedy and I make a mean guacamole. Okay, the rich, rich <laughs> lives we're hearing about. And now I think we must turn to Jay. Who are you? What do you do? Uh, my name is Jay Scherzer. And uh, after Zoom, my brother and I uh, um, ran, uh, owned and, and operated a balloon store in Framingham, Massachusetts. So we did some balloon deliveries for several years. Uh, when the balloon store closed, I uh, became a professional children's entertainer. And uh, that led into a career. Uh, I know it sounds like it wouldn't quite lead into it, but it led into a career of technical training and technical writing. And I'm still doing, I'm still doing technical writing to this day. Wonderful. And lastly, Bernadette, who are you? What do you do? Thanks, David. Um, I just want to say thank you for moderating, David, our webinar, our webinar tonight. Um, David is a brilliant writer, and his latest book, Sunny Days, is immensely entertaining and informative. And thank you, Christopher Sarson, for creating Zoom uh, and inviting me to join the cast. Your vision and your creative talents has changed my life forever. I'm Bernadette Yao. <laughs> I've been married for 32 years to my best friend, and we have two amazing daughters who are doing great things in the world, and we are so proud. Uh, I am a musician and a composer and a former TV producer, and I'm also a holistic health practitioner. Um, I studied music and telecommunications at IU Indiana University, and then after graduating, I returned to GBH and worked on programs um, such as Fetch, uh, Frontline, uh, Martha Stewart's first TV special, and uh, recently Fetch with Ruff Ruffman. Um, I was also a TV producer and host at a CBS affiliate in Boston, working on programming related to Asian American issues. Um, in addition, I sang with the Tanglewood Festival Chorus, which is a chorus for the Symphony Orchestra, Boston Symphony Orchestra and the Boston Pops. And now I lead um, sound healing workshops and I, rec I create music uh, recordings for meditation and healing. And I am now working on my fourth album with Leon to bring more light, love, and healing in the world. Thank that you, everybody. For <laughs> light, light, love, and healing awesome. is what I hope this, this evening will bring awesome. to the viewers as well. And perhaps to me and all of you as well. Um, <laughs> while we've got you here, Bernadette, I think we have to acknowledge the arm thing in the room. Um, I think the most <laughs> popular question, not only this week, but even last week when we did the season one Zoom cast webinar, the question we kept getting was, the, what is the story of Bernadette's arm thing? 
So I think we have to nip that in the bud up top so that our viewers will be satisfied narratively. And I think it's actually interesting because it's a story a little bit about Lori as well. So why don't we be begin with the idea that you each had to come up with a bit for your intro and you and Lori were friends and you were discussing it. That's right. Uh, we were talking about getting together and doing this. Uh, we were in the green room and they were calling <laughs> each cast member to go up and do their signature. This is what I remember. I know it's been 50 years. So Laura, you could tell me differently. So <laughs> she went up first and did her signature. We were down on the lower floor, so I didn't get to see what she did. And then when she came back in the green room, uh, we asked her what she did. She goes, oh, I did a backwards walkover. Or I think you did like it from the sitting and then up, up and over, which is really hard to do. And she was incredible <laughs> in gymnastics. She was the best. But I wanted to do that too, but I, I wouldn't have done it half as good as she did. And um, I said, Lori, what am I gonna do? I don't, I, don't, I don't have any idea. And she went, why don't you just do this? I'm Bernadette. You know, she kind of just did this with her hands. So I went home, I didn't have any idea. And I, I complained to my dad and I said, you know, I don't know what to Lori do. Lori stole Lori. my fender. <laughs> <laughs> Lori did the backwards walkover, which would have been better than what I could do. He says, I know, why don't you do this? And he started, he does it with the wrist. He did it like this. And I was like, what's that? He goes, it's a warlords in Chinese opera. His father used to take him. He's one of 18 children and his father, was loved taking my dad to the the performances that were there in Beijing. So he would take him to all these uh, Chinese operas and there were warlords that used swords, big swords doing this uh, like three times in a row. And he said, why don't you do that? And I'm like, oh, dad, that's so simple. And it's like, it's, I'm trying to be Americanized and this is going to make me even more Chinese and very Asian. <laughs> and so I had no other idea. So I came back to the set and they said, OK, Bernadette, you're next. And um, and so I did it and I just thought they were going to say it's silly and try something else. And that was it. That was the end of that. And um, I had no idea that people were starting to ask um, about how I did that. <laughs> and um, to, just so all of our viewers know, near the very end of this uh, event tonight, rest assured, Bernadette is going to give us a tutorial on how to do the <laughs> arm thing. So. Stay tuned. We're going to tease it out so to ensure that you keep watching. Bernadette will teach the arm thing. Christopher, I'd like to ask you about the response, the unanticipated response that Bernadette, Bernadette's arm thing did and how you experienced it as the producer of the show. Well, it was phenomenal. We didn't show any of the cast, any of the letters that we got ever. And as I said, we had a million and a half letters and we didn't show them to the, uh, uh, to the cast. Um, we asked Bernadette if she'd uh, do her arm thing and tell the viewers how to do it because we'd had a lot of mail about that. And she said, no, I don't really think I, I want to do that. And so we got some of the letters that uh, um, people had written. Some of the letters were this high. I mean, we're talking about a pile of letters that was huge. And we poured it out, uh, poured the sack out in front of her in the green room. And th that made her eyes widen. And she realized that uh, a lot of people did um, want her to do it. So uh, that's how uh, she got to do the explanation of it um, on the show. It was but quite dramatic. <laughs> I remember you just dumped this box of <laughs> letters on the table like, <gasps> I get to see the letters. <laughs> I think Maura, you Maura, you can speak to um, the the kind of startling experience of suddenly being recognizable, even though you're not a professional child performer. No, it's true. Um, I think that was the part that none of us really uh, anticipated, or or maybe quite knew how to handle. Um, but you know, I, I have uh, two recollections. Uh, one was that my family. Uh, we were out at McDonald's having dinner and a woman came up to my mother and said, oh, I know this is silly, but my kids think that's Mara from Zoom. And my mother said, it is. And the woman said, oh, could she please have dinner with my kids? Oh. So I had to sit with these kids and, and I don't mean any disrespect by this. Um, I sat with these people that I didn't know and the kids did nothing but stare at me. They didn't ask me anything. And, you know, when you're 10 years old, it, it's a little difficult to um, mm -hmm. navigate, like, how, what do I do? How do I react? 
do I, you know, are they expecting me to be on or just be me? And all I wanted to do was have dinner at McDonald's with my family. <laughs> um, the other time was we were, we were out uh, ice skating uh, at an outdoor rink uh, in the Boston area. And my parents were inside and they come out and they see this big mob of people standing around on the ice and they were afraid that somebody had been injured and all of a sudden out of the mob skates me <laughs> and you know it's just people wanting to talk to you look at you meet you and you know it, it's 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 wonderful um and it's a gift to experience that but i think at a young age um especially when it wasn't being encouraged by um you know, the, the people we worked with at GBH as to how do you handle this sudden recognition and fame. Um, so it was, it was an interesting process to try to kind of figure out how to, how to handle all that. Donna, I'd be curious to hear you speak to this because you were the first cast member who was a known Zoom fan. Because uh, first of all, tell us what happened in the pilot, which you were not part of mm. and how you figured oh, it out. Well, when I was eight years old uh, in the third grade, uh, was pre-Zoom uh, when the scouts were coming, I had written a series of books called the Miss Truitt series. So I'm sure my teacher must have told one of the scouts, oh, this is a, a young precocious child. And um, they came and they showed great interest in uh, the books. And first they asked me to write um, I, a, a cartoon. And this is before digital photography. So I actually spent the whole summer drawing um, the characters for this play, if you will, or the, the story. And after two months, they were like, ah, just write a play, would ya? So I did, and it ended up being on the pilot of the series, which was, um, Oh, wow. It was just such a, um, a blessing and just so wonderful for me. So, uh, and then um, two years later, uh, everyone I knew, because I grew up in Newton, Mass, was auditioning for Zoom. So I went along and uh, I don't know, luckily I uh, got picked. <laughs> and was it a heavy experience because you were already a fan of the show? Um, actually, no, I, it was very, uh, no one knew that I had written, it, I was just like everybody else. So, uh, yeah, I just remember being at the very first audition and it was almost like being in a firing line. Uh, I think Chris <laughs> said something last week that I was like 15 people. It felt like 40 to me, but I'm, you know, 10 years old. Uh, and all of a sudden they're like, sing the zoom song and everyone's looking really nervous and like, you know, very awkward and being like, come on and zoom, 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 ah, zoom. And something in my back of my head said, now or never. And I went, ba da 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 cha. <laughs> and I, uh, I got a call back. Okay. And Leon, Leon, you can speak to this too because you had two schoolmates in season one of Zoom in Kenny and Nancy. Um, and first of all, tell us about Elma Lewis School for of, of Fine Arts, was it? Yes, the Alma Lewis School of Fine Arts is an after-school program that Kenny, Nancy, and I attended. And the choreographer of Zoom, Billy Wilson, taught at. So we were actually performing in productions that the school would put on. And, you know, we had a little bit more, I think, of the understanding of dealing with public, uh, and being in the limelight in, in some circles. So I, I wasn't personally having a hard time. I wanted to be on, because I auditioned in the first cast with Nancy and Kenny and was upset that I didn't make it. So I was like determined the next time to definitely, definitely make it. And I did. <laughs> well, my understanding, Christopher, maybe you can clear this up, is that Leon was the youngest or younger than Kenny, certainly. So you held him in reserve, something like that? I didn't know that. Uh, tell me more. 
<laughs> no, Someone told me the story. It may not be true, but here we are. <laughs> One of the wonderful things about um, talking about these things 50 years later is that so much authority has disappeared. Either they've died or they've gone on to other things. And so you can make up, you know, you shouldn't let truth stand in the way of a good story. And uh, exactly. I think what Leon, <laughs> Leon says, you know, is probably true. Who knows? And uh, Anne, I have to ask you about your um, taking so well to the choreography. You were doing kind of proto-yoga poses in, in your performance. And were you a gymnast or what, what, what enabled you to do that? Um, I actually had been taking ballet lessons for a really long time. And I do think it sort of showed at the time I didn't know it. I actually remember Billy Wilson telling me that I needed to look a little bit more jazzy and more casual because, you know, classical ballet, you really have to stand and you kind of walk with your feet pointed out and all that sort of thing. So I think the arms and the extension and that sort of thing kind of came completely naturally to me. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I know you never asked me this question before. Can I tell you the story of how I got on Zoom? Because it's really different from these guys. <laughs> if it's an awesome story, yes, by all means. <laughs> I love Zoom and watch TV, watch it on TV. We were only allowed to actually watch a half an hour of television show a week at my house. So I picked Zoom, that was my choice. And Nancy came on one day and said, hey, we're gonna have a new cast of Zoom. So I was really excited and um, wrote in and applied to, you know, sent my little letter. And uh, they sent me a little piece of paper back telling me that, no, you just really don't qualify, so sorry. So I was sad, but my girl up the street got an audition and she had a little application form, one piece of paper. So I took her application form and do you guys remember typewriters and tracing yes. papers? Yes. I oh yeah. Tracing paper over the top of her and very carefully typed every single letter of every question, pulled it out, and then in pencil filled in my own answers. So she had her application and I had mine. And her mom gave me a ride on that Saturday. My parents weren't even involved in it at all. And I went and we were all in the lobby of WGBH, and there were hundreds of kids there and all these volunteer ladies with tables with the last letter of the name of the of whoever it was. So I walked up to the lady who had the box with the M's in it. And I said, hi, I actually didn't get my audition but I filled out an application anyway. And I, is there any chance I might be able to actually audition anyway? And she looked at me and she looked at my little piece of see-through translucent paper. Oh my God. burst into laughter and said, yeah, you definitely can audition. She <laughs> opened it up in there and that's how I got to do. <laughs> Never that knew awesome. that story. Wow. Never heard that story before. <laughs> Great story. Okay, now Jay, you you were seem to have been a natural comic even as a child. Your your intro has you honking the horns. Were you were you just a funny kid? Um yes, yes, I absolutely was. I was a funny kid. Uh, I'm the youngest of four boys in my family. Uh, I was the uh, I was definitely the entertainer. Um, we were all uh, very theatrical and very musical. Uh, one brother would would play the piano, and I'd I'd sing a song while he played the piano. And um, yeah, the, it 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 uh, being being funny. And 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 to this day, um, my my family thinks I'm a riot. <laughs> well, well, and you've been you've been a, a children's entertainer, so it it stands to reason that this would be your metier. <clears throat> now, one I have a very important question for all of you. What on earth happened to your Boston accents? Because I went back and looked at some old episodes and there was a Zoom rap. And if you don't remember viewers, the Zoom raps were these kind of free form conversations in which the Zoomers had these really heartfelt conversations about subjects that were not always easy, easy to talk about. And one was a Zoom rap about dreams. And Jay, and I wanna mention, you can view these at AmericanArchive.org which is the public television archive. You can now go and there's an entire Zoom collection of 100 episodes. But Jay, as you're kind of leading into the Zoom rap about dreams, you say, every single horror movie I ever watched, I had a bad dream after. And I, <laughs> and I thought, uh, Jay doesn't talk like that anymore. What happened? You know, David, I worked wicked hard to try to get rid of the accent. And now you just brought it all back to me, guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Oh well, yeah, um, you can dial it up when you need it. No doubt. Oh yeah. Um, what happened to the accent? It it yeah, I don't know. It <laughs> it got it's still it's still with the eleven year old kid in me. <laughs> it's still there. Um, 
Christopher, I want you to lead us into a conversation more with something you told me when I was interviewing you for my book. It's a, a distinction I never made before, and I think it's brilliant. You said there's a big difference for kids between being taught and learning. Please elaborate. Well, it's just part of what I believe. Um, I worked on a program to do with empathy, and the leader of that um, uh, that group uh, came up with this really, really, really good phrase. She said, empathy can't be taught, it can be caught. And what we did was to take a mother and baby into a classroom and the kids would be around this couple and they would learn because mummy was showing the kid empathy. And that's what the kids began to recognize and began to imitate and that's how they learned. And it was the same with uh, Zoom. We never once uh, sort of taught things. Um, the, we had this thing called Fanny Dooley, uh, where Fanny Dooley loves things with, I shouldn't tell you, but loves th uh, things with double letters, like uh, coffee. It doesn't like tea because there's no double letters in it. And we kept doing these little wraps of... Uh, uh, Fanny Dooley likes so-and-so and she doesn't like so-and-so. And it got the audience really annoyed. They would send in saying, tell us how Fanny Dooley is that. And we would send them examples of uh, Fanny Dooley, but we never once said, this is how you do it. And of course they learned it. Same with Abby Dubby. We never said, when I was in charge, we never said how to speak Abby Dubby. And <laughs> I was in... Uh, Colorado about 10 years ago, and there were a couple of uh, kids that had been taken to this dinner by their parents. And obviously they'd learned Abby Dubby to stop their parents understanding what they were saying. And um, it was wonderful. We never told them how to speak Abby Dubby, but halfway through the meal, we were all over 60 talking about the bison that had escaped and got killed on I-75 and you know all that terrible stuff and uh, the weather, uh, another boring subject. And one of the kids, 40 years old now, turned to the other and said across the table, aren't we sitting with a lot of boring people in Abby Dhabi? And imagine their faces when I said in Abby Dhabi, yes, I agree with you. And, but it's just an example of how something sticks in the child if he or she is learning it, as opposed to, you know, you've got to learn this and uh, uh, you, you have a teaching mode. Um, I'm, a I think part, I, I'm and, sorry, I think part of the charm too is that you, you kept the flubs in. You, you didn't make it perfect children's television. And um, Jay, I think you were uh, talking about a, a, some kind of sketch you did uh, in which Anne was a princess and you were wearing a cape yeah. or something. Can you relate I, that one to me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a princess in, in the tower skit, and uh, Anne, I'm, I'm sure you recall it. And we all uh, we all dressed up as uh, princes, and the the general idea was uh, Anne was in this tower, and we were to walk by, and uh, I don't know the exact details, but we we walked by, and she was calling for help, and uh, other princes. Uh, Leon was one of them. Uh, he was ahead of me. Uh, we were engaged, we, we engaged with Anne, they engaged with Anne while she was in the tower. And I thought, uh, wouldn't it be fun uh, if uh, instead of stopping and engaging with Anne, I kept walking. So that's that was the, the part of it that, that I had kind of pre-thought, pre-planned a little bit. So uh, it was my turn to walk out and, and engage with Anne. Um, help, help, she's calling for help. And I continue walking and she grabs my cape. <laughs> As I walked by, <laughs> she grabbed the cape as I walked by and pulled me back, and really didn't choke me. But we 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 had we had a good laugh. The camera kept rolling, and it was it was a lot of fun. And if you go back and watch that, which again you can on AmericanArchive.org, it's fun because of the the, the messiness and the spontaneity of and it, it. Yeah, and and it made it on the air. I mean, it was on the yeah, air. Yeah, it was, it was um, great. That was. One example. The, the first, let me let me just tell you the first mistake 
uh, that we aired in that way was uh, funnily enough um, with uh, Donna because uh, uh, she had written this play which we put on the first show and in it uh, Joe and uh, John uh, had a little talk and while they were talking a coin fell out of their pocket and went ding 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 and they began to burst out laughing and instead of saying oh darn we've got to do that from the beginning we left that in and we put a slide up that said take two and then yeah. they did it properly so you know that first mistake it comes from the opening song come on give it a try you don't have to succeed you do have to give it a try you do, and sometimes you would even try kind of cinema verite things, Christopher, because Anne can speak to this because she had her braces fitted while being filmed for your program. And Anne, can you speak about that experience? Oh, you're muted, Anne. There we go, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, I have a vivid memory of that. I was getting my braces adjusted and it was a Saturday morning because you can't bring a television crew to a dentist's office in the middle of the day. And um, me and a cameraman and a director and a, I don't know, 10, I felt like 10, that wasn't that many people squeezed into this room with the hot lights. And I was lying on the dentist chair and my orthodontist was very excited to have his moment in the sun. And uh, <laughs> they kept taking my braces off and then putting them on again. And then they'd say, hey, let's do another take. I want to get really close to her mouth because they wanted to get all those wires and everything. So they'd stick the the glue remover stuff on my mouth again. We'd wait, they'd rip my braces off. Hey, let's do it one more time. So I had my brace taken on and off of my mouth, like, I don't know, four or five times. You know, you're just this 12 year old lying there with your mouth wide open in this room, it's so hot. And finally they finished and I was like, oh, thanks so much. But I still have a line on my front teeth to this day. And it's because I spent hours with that glue remover stuff <laughs> on the front of my teeth. So and and, and uh, do, do you, do you uh, resent this experience or, do you, or did you actually, do you feel you benefit from it? You know, um, if I spent my time resenting something like that, my brain would explode. So no, I didn't. <laughs> it's just one of those things of my life that happened. And so there you are. <laughs> and, and indeed, um, you might, some of you might remember Michael Dean, who was on the same season with uh, Donna and Lori, I believe. Yeah, he was um, awesome. Who, the one who said, I'm Mike, da, 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 da. and I remember he was left-handed because I am also left-handed. Um, Christopher, didn't, didn't you have Mike uh, have his, his tonsillectomy was also on Zoom, I believe. <laughs> one of the great things that uh, we kept was uh, all the bad things that happened to the Zoom. No. Um, <laughs> It was really important to me. Well, I started, um, it's a whole big story that I won't go into, but uh, part of the evolution of Zoom was doing something at WBZ with Rex Trailer. Mm -hmm. And Rex Trailer, when I went to a Saturday morning where he was having his kids in and doing his show, he'd hurt his leg. And he entered the set normally by jumping over a fence. He couldn't jump over the fence. So before the show started, he was choreographing his walk, whereby a stagehand would pull the fence, he'd walk through it with a little jump, and then they'd put the, they went to endless pains to disguise the fact that this guy had hurt himself. And all the kids in the audience would love to know that Rex Trailer was human and that he'd hurt himself and blah, blah, blah. So when poor old Michael's mother, called and said, uh, guess what, uh, Michael can't come to rehearsal because he's having his tonsils out. Uh, I said, oh, I'm so sorry, and put the phone down. And Bunny Chesler, who was one of the five people on staff at that time, said, well, what are you waiting for? And I said, what do you mean? She said, go and film it. And so, believe it, oh, I hate this. believe it or not, I called the hospital and uh, said, can you delay the operation for an hour so we can get the cameras down there? And that's it. Oh, my goodness. And we had this wow. wonderful interview with <laughs> Michael and the doctor. The doctor was very good. And he was asking uh, Michael to ask questions and, you know, really getting into it. And it wasn't going to hurt. And he was, he was going to give, he told Michael, uh, an injection. He's going to give it, you turn him over in his rear end. He was going to give him an injection of anesthetic so that he wouldn't feel anything. 
And Michael came up with this wonderful question that I couldn't have written, no adult could have written it. He said in his pitched voice, why are you giving it to me in my rear end? Why don't you give it me nearer my tonsils? Which is a <laughs> wonderful question. And it's not, so, but anyway, airing this and airing um, and with the dentist. And we got lots of letters from parents saying how helpful it had been to the kids to see these things because uh, it helped them when they had to uh, go through those kind of ordeals. Right, it demystifies it and removes stigma and fear, all those things. Leon, you mentioned Billy Wilson, and I think I'd, I, I wish I could get a better picture because what Billy Wilson and the musical composer for the show, Newton Wayland, uh, have passed away and are not here to represent themselves. And if Everyone watches even the opening credits that we watched earlier, but then go through the archive and look at these production numbers. These guys must have been forces of nature. And Leon, I'm wondering if you can tell us about Billy and Newt a little. They were both, both magical, magical men. Yep. I, I was very enthralled with them both, that I stayed in contact with them and worked with them after Zoom. I did a off-Broadway musical uh, entitled Dancing in the Street, a Motown musical that Billy Wilson was the choreographer for. So it was such a great honor to be around such a strong, first of all, a strong Black man, a strong entertainer and a strong just a strong image because he knew that he was in that light people recognized him and saw him so he would dress a certain way it's is is cologne would stand out newt mm -hmm. was newt was the exact same way but not as a flashy type of guy. I mean, he lived in the woods in Santa Barbara. You know, I went to his house, it was like secluded, you know? And it was just like the opposite of Billy in terms of the outgoingness, but they both had such a wealth of what I love, music and entertainment. I always, I, I had my own dance company. I studied African dance with the Art of Black Dance of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. Started my own dance company, Djembe West African Drummers and Dancers. And all the time, I'm thinking of Billy, okay? <laughs> I'm thinking of the Amalu School and all the things that I've learned from such strong individuals. And the, the production numbers and the way that Newt was able to get us all in a recording studio and sing the way we sang, harmonies that, you know, we just, we just be ourselves. And it's right, right, and that's, it's, it's amazing because to me, if I think back to myself when I was in between age, I was utterly self-conscious and would never have had the gumption to do what all of you did. Mm -hmm. And Lori, I, I watched the Bowl Weevil production number the other day. I don't know if you remember <laughs> that. That was, you and Donna are in that one. And yeah. um, your it's joy in it was so palpable. You're having a blast. You too, Donna, but really, Lori. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that about participating in these amazing numbers. I mean, what a blessing and what a joy as as uh, you know, to sing and dance with friends and just to, to, to be sometimes in costumes. I mean, that was my literally my favorite part of Zoom was the production numbers. My sisters and I would practice on Wednesday nights when we got the tape and the tape recorder and they'd help me memorize the songs. They even know the songs till today. And we'd go on Friday nights and I, that was the best to leave school on Friday and go with all my friends and sing and dance and do the production numbers, such joy. Um, that was literally my favorite part of being on Zoom, was singing and dancing. I loved it. Right. And, and Donna, you ended up doing this professionally. Did, was it a straight line from doing it on Zoom to wanting to be a professional? Uh, not, not really. After I was 12 when I got off Zoom, and um, I did go to NYU Drama School uh, 
I transferred from Colby College when I was 20. Which is so, incredibly hard to get into, by the way. So, <clears throat> okay, well, but can I tell you a, a Billy Wilson story that I have? Um, and I too, I loved those production numbers and they were just so magically fun. But um, Billy Wilson, like what an honor it was to have worked with him. He had this knack for choreographing children and non-professional dancers. And like, for instance, he'd be, I think they talked about it last week, but you know, he'd say, okay, uh, you have five beats to go yeah. from here to there and do whatever you want. And you know, so that would be great. But when he would look at you and meanwhile, everyone's, you know, there's six other uh, Zoomers around, but when he would talk to me, it was like I was the only person in the world. And mm -hmm. it's almost like he was beaming pure potential to me. Like I just, <laughs> he just had such a knack for um, empowering mm -hmm. uh, children. And, and I'm assuming adults as well. Uh, he um, just, just, I'm getting chills actually. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but he was, he was just such a special, being on that show, really such an honor and gosh, 50 years later and even talking about this and making it real. And uh, it's just, I feel very special. I feel like I should be pinching myself a little bit right now, which I am. <laughs> and Maura, I, I think another interesting thing is how free it all seems. Like you're always on the floor on your stomach reading letters, you know, <laughs> from the prone position. Not sure I could do that now, but. <laughs> we were barefoot. <laughs> it wasn't just in front of the camera. It's um, you, you, you had the run of WGBH. You were. Yeah. Mm. Oh, no oh, we did. Oh, oh yes, we I, did. I think that uh, there are probably some pretty legendary stories. Um, yes. You know, the Zoomers were banned from the cafeteria at one point, I guess. So. Yeah, I mean, that was like our playground, the whole building, yeah. not simply the studio or the Zoom offices or the green room where we would wait uh, when we weren't doing something. Uh, Maura, do you know, Maura, do you know mm -hmm. why you were banned from the cafeteria? <laughs> why? <laughs> Probably. Well, the story, the story I heard, and hopefully is fictitious, but, you know, they had these tannoys where they made announcements to throughout <laughs> the whole uh, building. And the announcement uh, was as follows. Would the person in charge of the Zoomers please go to the cafeteria? They seem to have found some spiders and they're putting them in the microwave. Oh, <laughs> no, that must have been so after it, us. But we, yeah, I there think was... It was <laughs> There are some uh, definitely uh, strange experiences uh, or things that happened in the cafeteria. Let's, let's leave it right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't mean to open a can of worms or, or okay. spiders. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I think another thing is that a lot of people have asked is like behind the scenes, how many adults were there? And um, both Donna and, and Anne, I spoke to you earlier and you both brought up that there were kind of mentor figures uh, in the studio, like uh, uh, Donna, you mentioned someone named Pat. Yeah, was... uh, Pat Gregson, who was an associate producer. She was kind of like the handler uh, when when I was on Zoom. Lori, do you remember her? Yeah, Pat? she was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm she... sorry, what, what do you mean by a handler? Like a, well, a child wrangler? Or well, it, I, I, a wrangler, <laughs> kind of like someone, I, I'm assuming that she was there to make sure that we were okay, but she was like a like a an older sister or a young aunt and um she was so kind and generous and just a, a loving and she made me personally feel like family and um uh I, just a funny story i my mom wouldn't let me get my ears pierced till i was 11 and that happened to be on zoom at the time so i got my ears pierced and um pat gave me all of her like childhood stud earrings and um Mm -hmm. I, I think I still have them today. And um, so Pat, if you're still alive and out there, thank you so much for being just such a wonderful, wonderful person. Christopher, how did you not sick a camera crew on Donna's getting her ears pierced? Did you she not didn't know? Tell me. She didn't <laughs> tell me. Somebody has to tell me things. Um, David, can I go back to, to, uh, um, uh, to the choreographer and musician for Please. a bit? Um, they, those two, were, as the cast has said, were absolutely brilliant. 
they deserve as much credit as I do for making the uh, uh, Zoomers dance and sing the way they did. Um, Newt, I met Newt two years before uh, Zoom and uh, he, I was running a program called Performance and he said, boy, that's boring. I said, yes, I know it is. My music, my background is music as well. He said, let's turn it into rehearsal. So instead of the performance starting and then half an hour later finishing, we had rehearsal where the musicians were stopping and talking about the music and getting, it was a wonderful show. Anyway, um, he came up with the idea we rehearsed. Um, I should tell you that the way that Zoom worked was through the families. This was not a group of kids who came and then went home and that was that. I interviewed the parents as much as I interviewed the, mm. uh, um, the uh, cast themselves. And um, they had to, if they dropped a grade or if they, they got bad reports at school because of Zoom, then they were off the show. And we never had to exercise that, but that was one of the rules. And um, <clears throat> on Wednesday evening, we would get the kids after school and take them in a cab. And Bernadette, you should speak to the cab ride um, after I finished. Uh, we'd get them in a cab and they'd come and they'd rehearse until six o'clock, seven o'clock, something like that, and then go, they'd go home. On Friday night, they came in again. And this time we kept them till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, even midnight sometimes, because mm -hmm. they didn't have anything to do. They didn't have to get up early on Saturday. And the music that Newt wrote, we put onto tapes and gave <laughs> the kids on Wednesday. And they learned it on Thursday and Friday, and then came back and we did the show that it was in on uh, Friday. It was an extraordinary, um, it was an extraordinary performance. Um, now, Bernadette, Christopher alluded to the story I, I want to get into with you, but first, Christopher was saying, you know, we, we, we made sure we were involved with the families, but you were utterly flabbergasted to meet an adult like Christopher. And tell us about how that was uh, astonishing for you when you first spoke with him. Yeah, I, I was raised in a very typical um, uh, Chinese American family in, in uh, the suburbs. And um, when we would get together with our friends who were Chinese American or um, relatives, I was always calling them either by auntie or uncle, but never, you know, directly saying their name. It wasn't polite to do that in, in the, our culture. And when I got to Zoom, uh, to we would meet in the Zoom room, which is where all the producers, Christopher was, and uh, Bruce Marson, Kate Taylor, all these people, Manya Joblin, um, Bunny Chesler, and they, it, Chris said, why don't you just call me Chris? Bruce was like, call me Bruce. And I'm like, because I was Mr. Sarson, <laughs> Mr. Mm. Marson. And I was really stunned. I, it was a little scary for me because I really did think of them. I thought I was, I was supposed to call them uncle or auntie, but it really brought me more um, an understanding that they could see me and hear me and wanted to hear my opinion and um, and that we were more on a even level which was really nice i just want to also mention the the crew um I, first of all just i know that bruce bordet is watching he was in the crew he also worked with julia child and i'm so grateful that he's watching low hartnett is watching she uh retired as the uh director of development at gbh i was her administrative assistant um, she was ahead of like a staff of like over 45 people but she read the zoom mail when we were on zoom so she was one of the few people that were across the street and, and was reading the mail from the beginning. So she's also watching us tonight. Um, and for me, the crew in the, in, the, in the studio meant a lot to me. The floor manager, Dave DeBaja, uh, Skip Wareham, <laughs> Greg McDonald, Frank Lane, Chaz Norton, the great lighting director, and he's out there doing all this stuff. And, and many more, um, Jim, James Fields, who's the director. Um, director. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the interesting thing is my life from then until now has been, uh, there's been a continuum. First of all, Fred Buda was playing in that rehearsal video mm -hmm. of the Saturday Night, Saturday, Everybody Loves Saturday Night um, 
in, in all the different languages. He played for the Boston Pops. I happened to sing soprano and we were always sitting behind his, his drum cage. So I was sitting behind the plexiglass with him. And every time I sat there and we were getting ready for a concert, he turned around and go, hey, kiddo. And then he said, how's Leon doing? <laughs> and then um, Greg McDonald, the cameraman, and, and um, Frank Lane um, would be out in the audience at Boston Symphony Hall with their cameras when we were doing specials. And I'd see them downstairs and they'd ask me how I'm doing. They were like my uncles or my big brothers. And I ended up moving uh, after I worked at GBH to Channel 7. And I met a man who eventually became my husband. And he was a he was a video photographer for the news for CBS News. So he would go out to a lot of these shoots that Greg and Frank from GBH would be at. So I would come back to GBH and just visit and say, you know, I met this guy in the elevator at Channel Seven, and mm -hmm. you know, he he asked me out, and I th I think I like him. And Greg looked at me and said, good, he's a good man, I approve. <laughs> you know, so that made that helped me. You know, and I went on and. Um, my job at Channel 7, uh, Bruce Marson was the executive producer, um, so he helped me uh, get into that, and he trained me and really mentored me. Um, and then when I went to Fetch with Ruff Ruffman, Kate Taylor was the executive producer of the children's programming. So I have all of them to thank, and it, my marriage, <laughs> all the things that I did at, at, in television uh, was because and, of that. And you're still making music with Leon. And that's, I, right. that's something I want to look at because as Christopher mentioned earlier, the Zoom kids were taken to the studio and from the studio in Boston cabs that were arranged for them. And Lori, Leon and Bernadette rode together. And, I, and you began as strangers and you kind of developed this uh, friendship in those cab rides, right? Leon, yes. elaborate. <laughs> Those, those cab rides, I love those cab rides. Just to be able to sit there, we listen to the music together. And, you know, we didn't know each other, but no. it was a chance for us to get to know. So it was Bernadette and I at first, and we would just always, I'd sit up front or she'd sit up front and we'd listen to the music. And then Laurie joined and she and Bernadette became this whole thing, and me and the driver, we had our thing. It was just like a great ride that we look forward to all the time, sharing this time with each other before we got to the studio. Did, like, did, you, know, did you have the same driver every time, Leon, or was it? Yes, yes, we had the same driver. Tell me about him. Oh, it was a black man. I can't remember his Was name. it Mr. Bill? Mr. Bill? It might have been Mr. Bill. <laughs> he used to come to my school and pick me up all the time. And then we go to Bernadette's and pick up Lori. It was just like a joy ride. <laughs> I, have a, I have a quick story about cabs. So um, when we auditioned, I auditioned with many of you four times. Um, and the second audition, the cab picked me up at my junior high, but instead of dropping me off at WGBH, it dropped me off at channel four. And so I was wearing white pants and new blue shoes. And I ran across the field of Harvard Yad to get to the studio, to get to the audition on time. And when I got there like 45 minutes late, my pants were all blue, but I still sang my song. And I made it to the audition, but I literally was like 12 years old running across the field to this other TV station because my cab driver drove me to the wrong studio. <laughs> tenacity, my friends, tenacity. Oh, so tenacity indeed. It's not just cab rides though, it's the cultural exchange that occurred in that car of, yeah. of an Asian girl, a black boy and a white girl, you know, from different uh, ethnic backgrounds and, and social strata. And Jay, I, I wonder if you can uh, elaborate upon this. This was not a great time for Boston social issues wise. We were, had, were in the midst of the busing crisis. And so this is for you a form of cultural exchange, right? You're meeting kids you wouldn't normally have met. Yeah, absolutely. I was, um, I was uh, born and raised in uh, Newton. 
And um, Zoom was was the, the first time that that I was exposed to diversity. I don't even think the word diversity existed back in 1972. So we we were we were we were so groundbreaking at, at, at so many levels, and and especially for me personally, where I was working intimately shoulder to shoulder with this wonderful group of, of diverse people uh, really gave me a, a, um, a, a really uh, first first person experience uh, with with that. Right. And Bernadette, you talked about actually having some shame about bringing your Chinese-ness to the fore until Zoom. Yeah, I mean, when I was in school before Zoom, um, I was teased and bullied a lot um, for being Asian. We lived in several towns and it, it, there were some very scary times for me. And um, but when I got to Zoom, um, things changed both in for me at home. When I got back to school, um, people didn't see me as the Asian child anymore. I think they just saw me as Bernadette. But definitely at, at GBH, I never felt like I was the Chinese girl. And let's give her a Chinese part and ask her to, there was never any of that. Later on, I did pursue some acting, but the parts that were given to me, could you do a Chinese accent, which I really can't, I can't fake it. I've tried to do it with my daughters and they laugh at me because I can't fake a Chinese accent, but <laughs> I didn't want to do that, you know? And at GBH it, on Zoom, I was just Bernadette. I was one of the kids it was never an issue. And um, I was used to that. I was used to that, which was wonderful, wonderful. It is. Okay. I, and now I think I feel, wait, did, Anne, did you want to jump in? Say a sentence or two about that. I think one of the things that, that really mattered to me is that there was tremendous diversity also in the staff and the crew, and also a lot mm -hmm. of women, a lot of women working there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, we were so young that that was my first um, experience of what it was like to work and have a job. And so everybody around me who was working and had a job had a lot of different nationalities. They were black, white, brown, rich, poor, people, women, people coming in cabs, people coming not in cabs. And one of the things that I enjoyed so much about Zoom is that it, the fact that we were, the seven of us, in front of the camera for a really small part of the time compared with all of the other things that happened before we made Zoom, the actual being on in front of camera for me was kind of a small part of the whole thing. And the just the experience of everything of being in the scene docs and of rehearsing and practicing at night and and getting home mm -hmm. late and watching with my with my family. It just the the experience wasn't just about being on a television show. I it was about what it was like to work really hard in a professional environment with many different people who are cooperating at such a high level around creativity and equality. I mean, it just was very profound, I think. I didn't even realize that soaked into me that what a difference that that made to have that opportunity. It, it modeled something of what you're doing now just to a degree. I guess so. <laughs> okay, now, Anne, while I've got you, we've got to start in on the audience questions because there are so many and time is flying by. So <clears throat> Riley writes, Anne, I always wondered how you injured your left arm that was often seen bandaged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that happened a lot. <laughs> yeah, I broke my wrist jumping off the um, the double bed. Like we say you wait in the middle of the night and I had to jump off the top bunk and I slipped and broke my wrist. The reason it was shown so much is that we did that promo and the actual beginning thing of the show and then something else that aired a lot um, all like within that two weeks. And so I just happened to have a cast on for several things. Like I think my arm was in a sling at one sling. Time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah sling off and then later it was wrapped up and so it was I only had one injury it just happened that <laughs> we did a couple of weeks now now okay here's a question from Doyle is Lori is it oh. true that you are a master of ubby dubby I was what? just curious a master new... hi my friend I don't know I don't know I, I, I don't know was I yes I was okay yes. <laughs> I seem to recall you could speak it very quickly and very yeah. clearly and very and very well. <laughs> okay, here's a question. Thank from, you, Abu. Thank you, Abu. Here's a question <laughs> from Pat from Mora. What was it like being a younger member of the cast? Um, 
a little bit different. Um, I was among the younger group. Um, I think David and I are the same age and Leon or Nancy. So we were, you know, definitely on the younger end, um, but I was the oldest in my family. So it's kind of a strange, uh, strange mix there. Um, I probably wasn't nearly as uh, worldly, shall we say, <laughs> uh, at 10 as somebody might have been at 12. Um, so, you know, there was a, a lot of learning uh, about the world and different things, but um, it really, I mean, we all just got along. And that doesn't, not, not to say we were all best buddies, but I mean, there was really never any clickiness or some people were part of the group and some were not. It was never like that. So really was never yeah. like that. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Never. Absolutely true. This, this next one isn't really a Zoom question, but I find it amusing. So Jay, Randy says, I live in Framingham now. Where was your balloon store? <laughs> oh. Randy, thank you. That's a great question. We were on the corner of Edgell Road and Route 9, right near Framingham State University. It was Framingham State College. But now it's Framingham State University. They got university credentials. And while but, just uh, briefly, while we're talking about your adult life, I think you have to tell us what your professional clown name was. <laughs> my my professional clown name was JJ Smiles. And how was Smiles spelled? <laughs> it was S M Y L E S. Thank you for asking. And, and your company was called. My company was called Clown for Hire. And how was hire spelled? <laughs> H-I-G-H-E-R. Oh. I am drawing this all out of you because I think this is a Will Ferrell movie waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> if you're out there, I think uh, contact Jay for the, the, the life rights because I'm sure it's a hell of a story. Um, Lori asks, is Donna wearing her original shirt? Ooh, good question. Uh, no. I'm not Lori, but um, this is a CBGB shirt I got at a thrift shop, but I do still own two of my shirts. I just don't know where they are. Okay. Were you speaking of BW, Donna? No. What What's that? What's the name <laughs> of that shirt? What was that? Oh, CBGB. Oh, I see. It's a club. CBGB. <laughs> okay, Patrick asks, um, he asks about Louise and David, who we already acknowledge are here tonight, but I think Christopher, you can speak to this, that, that the Zoomers that you work with are all still pretty much in touch with each other. Well, not only in touch with each other, but as we heard from uh, Leon and Bernadette, they're working together. And uh, I learned a couple of nights ago, who are the three of you that are starting a talk about it? Uh, Donna. Oh, um, well, uh, Lori, Bernadette, and myself are uh, launching a podcast called Zoom Girl Talk, which will be uh, launched in the springtime. And we're going to be talking about subjects, current subjects that are important to us individually and as us as women. And we're also going to uh, walk down memory lane and include our Zoom brethren um, and interview them and sort of have some Zoom girl and guy talks and raps. It's extraordinary that um, all 21 of us are still, well, 17 of the 21 of us are still talking to each other. But it's even more extraordinary. I don't know what was going on in 1972, but as someone said about the cabs, you know, you were forming friendships which have lasted, as one of you said earlier, more than most marriages. Um, <laughs> I think Mar Mara mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, right. oh, that Nancy, said, Nancy I, mentioned it. As yes. long as the okay, relationships yeah. have yeah, yeah, lasted. Yeah, um, Mara, you mentioned to me that there was kind of a belated dawning upon all of you of mm -hmm. just how um, sticky Zoom is in people's heads that mm -hmm. years later mm -hmm. when Facebook happened, you were suddenly being friended by people you'd never met. True. Um, you know, unlike so many other shows, uh, you know, like Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch, these, these shows are on constantly. So you couldn't forget about them if you wanted to. Um, Zoom was never uh, on, on in rerun form. And so, you know, as social media 
allowed people to kind of find us and reconnect. Um, it was amazing to realize how many vivid memories people had of the show um, or different segments, uh, even more memories than what I may have had. Um, we also did not have any copies, maybe a random one here or there of our shows. Mm -hmm. So as they've kind of you know been archived now and whatnot, we're seeing things for the first time in yeah. you know 45 or 50 years. It's, it's been amazing. Um, and what's also amazing is that you've met celebrity level people who view you as a celebrity, <laughs> even though they're now adults. Leon. Well, I think Leon has many more of those experiences, yes. but I will tell you that um, through Facebook and because of Zoom, um, I was friended by a gentleman who uh, has been a drummer, uh, done a lot of different work uh, out in LA, and he uh, has recently, a couple of years ago, I guess, uh, became a uh, part of Brian Wilson, uh, Beach Boys, Brian Wilson. Uh, he's been part of his touring band. And it's just mind boggling to think that somebody like him views a chance to meet one of us as a big deal. And I'm thinking, dude, you're living the dream, right? <laughs> you are working and recording with Brian Wilson and you want to meet Zoomers? <laughs> just, and and so Leon, Leon, you've had that too. Can you talk about that? I, okay. John Stamos <laughs> from that television show, I was on it with him. Uh, what is it? Full House. Full House. Full House. Yes. Yeah, Full House. <laughs> He's a drummer for the Beach Boys. And yes. Ryan Wilson and them, I've worked with them too. They're all Zoom fans, okay? <laughs> yeah. I was, it, I was- It's crazy. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, was, I was performing with a band at the China Club and it was very heavy <sighs> celebrity thing. And on the side of the stage was uh, Verdine White, the bass player from Earth, Wind and Fire. Oh, um, wow. Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees. <laughs> and um, not, uh, lead singer of the Eagles, uh, Don Henley. Don Henley. So we're playing, I'm playing a song and the band stops. And all of a sudden I hear, Come on and zoom, zoom, zoom. <laughs> sung by these three guys. I'm like, oh. I'm like, wait a minute. You mean to tell me you know me from Zoom? They took me downstairs. I met uh, the, the, the guy from Soul Train, Don Cornelius. Don Cornelius. Yeah. I'm like, He's a big Zoom fan. Hey, Leon! <laughs> Are you serious? Okay, I went to Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker said to me, I'm acting because of you. Mm. I want it to be you. Mm. Mm. And I'm like, huh? I, I got to put music in his first production, his first film that he did, Strapped. The first thing you hear in the film is me singing my music. It's right there. He's like, I gotta have you in this. I mean, wow. Like Eddie Vedder from Pearl wow. Jam, at least. Mm -hmm. Drop it down, kissing my feet. I'm like, huh? He's like, man, you're Leon from Zoom. I love you. I'm like, <laughs> you know what, I, you know what I'm learning, Leon? The rest, the other six of you Zoomers need to get out more. And, and <laughs> Seriously. Of this, of this, this is love. true. Um, I think we have to get to some more uh, questions from the audience because we really want to make sure we honor them. Um, good question from Laura, which I'll throw open to the floor here. If you have siblings, how did they react to your being on Zoom? Did you ask me? Laura, you can take it. No, it's from- Oh, a, I thought you said Laura. Her name is Laura, but it's a good Oh, question. hi, Laura. Um, like I said, when I was talking earlier, my two sisters were amazing and still are. In fact, as Maura stated, since all these reruns have come back and many of us haven't seen them for 50 years, I've been sending them to my sisters. We're like, we remember the words to those songs. I mean, uh. memories of the magic from <clears throat> singing those songs with my siblings and rehearsing with them and making sure that I got it right. The beautiful thing about my family was there was never jealousy. It was pure um, uh, love for the opportunity. 
Um, and they were so gracious and allowed me to, 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 to have this opportunity with them supporting me and being right there by my side. They never showed any other um, reaction except for pure joy. So my experience with my family was just wonderful. Wonderful. And I can speak to that as well. Please do, Jen. I, I just, just real quick, and thank you for that question, Laura. Um, so I have three <clears> older <throat> brothers. I'm the youngest of, of uh, four boys in my family. Um, I was, I was, um, I, I never felt that, that they were ever um, uh, angry or anything at me because of Zoom. Um, one of my brothers was actually at the final um, callback where the four names were announced of the new Zoomers. So he was in the, the Connors room at 125 Western Ave in, uh, in Boston to, to witness the, uh, the, the, that final announcement of the four names. So yeah, I was I was very very well supported by my brothers during that time. You know, I have a a brother who is a music director at a radio station in Boston, and uh, people ask him all the time about his sister, and it's <laughs> again kind of mind boggling. I think um, they enjoyed being part of the experience, but not in the experience. So yeah. I also want to note that Maura, like about 10 years before John Madden did it, burst through an enormous sheet of paper. <laughs> so um, you originated that yeah, move. I don't know. They never asked me if I wanted to do that. They just said, by the way, here's what you're going to do for your opening. And um, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Bernadette, maybe you can feel this one from Ellen. What was up with the bare feet? <laughs> You know, I want to know that myself, because I think as soon as we could, I put my socks and shoes back on. But they did that before I came on Zoom. So I had to follow suit. Maybe somebody else can answer that has been there longer yeah, the than fir me. the first cast needs to really own that one. Because yeah, they said they said. The, yeah. Chris, oh, Chris, was there, was there, there any? Chris, was, was there any? It wasn't a policy. It was just uh, they wanted to go around in bare feet. So sure, they could go around in bare feet. We got letters from parents complaining about it. And luckily, we had a tame child psychologist on board who could say it's fine for them to go around in bare feet because uh, they'd much prefer uh, you all to wear socks and shoes. Um, I, I do want to reiterate, excuse me, that uh, some people have asked me, me to uh, say the, the name of the link again to find the 100 episodes of Zoom. It's AmericanArchive.org. And then you just type Zoom into the search field and you'll see these episodes. They're grouped by season. There's not a lot of uh, episode descriptions, so you kind of just have to hunt through them, but you won't go wrong. You just click on an episode and you'll, you'll enjoy it. Um, I, I'm sorry, I have to raise my hand and ask a question that's sort of been asked by other people, but I'm gonna put it to you. Yes, David? How can we make this gathering here not just a nostalgia trip? What is there, what can we learn from your experience in the early 1970s that we could apply to what we're going through now and how we live now? I like to say hmm. this is a multicultural experience before there was multiculturalism. Yep. This is a example of pure innocence, love and respect, and honor of each other. And that's what it takes. You know, we still have that to this day. We can disagree and we can still be, you know what I mean? Because we are different and we can share and learn from the differences of each other. And that's what we did. I remember Jay being that inquisitive kid asking me questions about black culture. I remember my thirst and my love of the Chinese culture and the Jewish culture and all these things that we weren't exposed to in our daily lives. So the exposure, it makes you a better person. I, I, oh, I'm sorry, Donna, you go and then oh, just really quick, I was just gonna say, I feel that Zoom for me, planted seeds of um, empathy, compassion, and respect. And uh, due to some of the work that uh, I'm doing uh, with my company, uh, we find that where empathy, compassion, and respect live, there can be no harassment. There can be no 
I mean, you might not agree with someone, but you're in a safe space to actually be yourself and, um, and, and move forward, you know, uh, with confidence. Um, so I, and I do believe that, uh, those are, are aspects that, that Christopher really planted in the show. He baked it in the show and, um, yeah, it would be great for the world to listen especially with what's going on now. But Bernadette, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I think as groups of children, we saw each other as friends that we could go and have a you know play date or whatever. And I'd like to propose as, hum as, as adults that we are all human. No matter what you see here, the color of our skin or the disability that someone has, we're all human. And I think what Zoom captured was the creative process, that aspect that brought us back into ourselves, that we could feel our own way of dancing. Billy allowed us five beats. You do what you have to do to get there. Do this or twirl or whatever you want to do. And we got to access what we felt inside and what, um, what jazzes us. And that's what creative process is. Rather than living in fear and projecting out towards other people and scapegoating, come back to self, find out what's here that hurts or is vulnerable or that jazzes you and cultivate that and then do it in communication and communion with others. That I think is going to help people to see each other for what's in their heart and what brings them joy and expands into love and that we are all human. And that's what Zoom meant to me. And that's what I like to bring forward into this time right now. Right. Let me, wow, just, let me just go <laughs> from what uh, oh, Bernadette yeah. just said, um, because it's fascinating. Uh, all the shows that weren't Zoom were telling stories, or they were doing what Bernadette said, throwing something out to you. What you guys did was to show who you were, and you appealed to the hearts and the minds of the audience. And that's what they remember. And that's what, you know, brings them together now. And it's a very important part of, uh, uh, of Zoom. And it would be lovely to have that in the world now. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, two questions at once from two different viewers because they're related and it's a good way to wind up our Q&A section. Um, Allison says, for those of you with children, what do they think of you being on Zoom? And Josh asks basically, could it happen again with, with the current generation of children where he says when kids are over-programmed and over-protected? Um, so it's two things. What do your children think of you having been Zoomers? And do you think something like this could be pulled off today? <laughs> I would like to uh, state, um, I became legal guardian of my daughter when she was five years old. And it has been the single most amazing experience of my life. I think that it's hard for her to even wrap her head around the idea that I was ever on a TV show. It's mm -hmm. just, she doesn't know that me. And, you know, uh, I think it's same with my nieces and nephews. I don't think Zoom would work today because it's just such a different world. We did not have electronics. We didn't have you know, 250 channels and, and, you know, smartphones and everything else. And I just think that kids today, their attention spans are shorter. Um, I don't know that they're quite as in, they're engaged in a different way. So if anything like Zoom were to happen, I don't think it would be anything like the form it was in originally back in the 70s. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree and with that. And, and let me just say, um, I have five, <laughs> I have five grandchildren and um, our, my four-year-old uh, four will can watch um, the, the, the beginning of an episode or can watch an episode and um, she will dance and, and sing along with the episode. So it's, it's still very appealing to, to young children. The show is, has, still has that appeal to it. Um, the, the, certainly the Zoom that we did couldn't work today or wouldn't work today, but some kind of children's show with kids, something like that. I think it could work. I think it could if, if, they, if they did it very smartly. And, and Leon, do you want to add to that? Yes, I disagree. 
I mm. think I think that the programming that we are seeing today is programming from what we did. Take a look at a at a podcast. A podcast, people are just being themselves. These are the things that are really growing nowadays. The live stream performances that are going on. People are performing these things live and they're just doing this, showing themselves. And this is the way programming is coming down now. It's not so much formatted mm -hmm. that within this half hour, this happens. But I think that the format and the things that we were able to do in our Zoom wraps, our mail sessions, our production numbers are influencing what we are seeing today. Now, can the program Zoom be created and done today? Sure. <laughs> well, you invented user generated content, Christopher. And on that note, yeah. gang, it's time. It is time. Bernadette, the floor is yours because everyone here, including your peers, needs a refresher on how to do the arm thing. I need a refresher. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Everybody, put your two arms out and then cross over your dominant arm over your. Yeah, so David, you do your left arm. I'm right. doing my right. And let the elbows meet, okay? And then you're just going to twirl like this and cross over to the other so that your non-dominant arm is over the dominant arm. And then, you know, do that. It has to have a flare, so it's like this. And then separate. <laughs> Try it where's at home, the, and you get where's it. The sound, where's the sound <laughs> effect? Wait, Actually, yeah. Sound effect? You need a second dog. <laughs> <laughs> Donna, you're you're a pro. You've clearly done this. Ooh, oh yeah. Donna, go. Awesome. Okay. Well, Donna, you got it, gang. I, first of all, I think some thank yous are in order. Um, I'd like to thank Tom McCoy, who's our producer on this. Thank you, Tom. Hey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. Season one Zoomer and oldest living yeah. Zoomer, Tom White, for being our production thank consultant. Thank you, Tommy. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Tommy. And I think a lot of folks have said, can you send a link or can, I'm just going to put my Twitter handle out there. So if you have questions about the podcast that's coming up or about American Archive, um, I'm at, you know, the at signal, Mr. Camp, and it's with a K. So at M-R-K-A-M-P, reach out to me and I'll do my best to answer the uh, logistical questions, not the emotional questions that uh, <laughs> you, might, you might need to follow up on. But now, gang, um, I also want to thank you, all of the Zoomers. I want to thank Maura and Lori and Leon and Bernadette and Donna and Jay and Anne and especially Zoom Papa Christopher for making this all Zoom possible. Papa. Could, could I say one I thing? I really, oops, please, I'm sorry. Uh, I just what? wanted to acknowledge the fans. We are, I can speak for me, I think I speak for all of us. We are so grateful that you have kept the memory of Zoom alive uh, and the interest in the 50th anniversary and just thank you for making it what it was. Um, well, just really we're nothing without our audience. audience. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. Appreciate everyone. And on of you. that yes. note, we have to do the ultimate in fan service because uh, <laughs> Zoomers, there's only one way to end a Zoom <laughs> on Zoom. True. I, I'm true. gonna preface it with two statements. One is that Box 350 Boston, Mass. is no longer in operation, so do not send letters there. Um, number two, because we are on Zoom, we call conferencing medium, there's delays in sound, so we may not get this perfectly. But nevertheless, Zoomers, hey, that, that's thank me. you all. Love you all. Your audience loves you. We love the audience. And now I'm going to count you in. Box 350. Boston, Mass. Oh, one, three, four. That is wonderful. Thank, thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has right. been awesome. Thank you. Yeah. It's great. Yep.